Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. We are the Sustainable Education Ghana team, um, and our project is to build a sustainable girls' school in Shogakobe, Ghana. We're working with a nonprofit organization called Voices of African Mothers, and this school will be part of a larger sort of ecological um, educational village in Shogakobe that has an onus on women's empowerment. Yeah, so a little bit about our team. Uh, we're a fairly large team. We have 22 undergraduates and eight systems engineering graduate students. Some of those are distance learning students, as you'll see um, on the QB machine here. We also have four advisors, two in architecture and two in engineering. Uh, our team comes from five different colleges, and rather than having sub-teams, it's more of a collaborative approach. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, so this is a bit of a hodgepodge timeline for what we did this semester. We started out in a collaborative uh, design strat phase with our entire team of roughly 30 students and then moved into reallocating tasks a little bit more specifically by skill set. And then we went into the architectural design phase and empathy testing, which we'll talk a bit more about. And now we have pretty much a completed design and looking forward to uh, yeah, so this is just a roadmap of what we're going to talk about. We, instead of splitting it up by team or sub-team, it's more of a chronological approach. So it's a little bit of the transition from last semester into our organization and testing, then into the final design and then moving forward. So um, to start that off, this is kind of our first section. Um, this is the time when we took our, our work from last semester and moved forward into this. Yeah, so a little bit of background about this project. Um, our stakeholder is Voices of African Mothers, which is was founded by Nana Fosu Randall, who was one of the accountants for the UNICEF um, branch of the UN. And she's been running Voices of African Mothers um, for many years, and most of their, all of their projects are focused on women's empowerment in the African region. And her background is that she traveled a lot um, in war-torn countries and really noticed that there was a need to have a nurturing and supportive environment specifically for women so that they can realize their value and their ability to contribute to society in a meaningful way. So right now, VAM runs several um, microfinance um, initiatives uh, throughout Africa, or throughout Ghana mainly, um, and other parts of Africa, and they run several schools. So VAM Village is their sort of newest um, vision for uh, a very like inclusive um, women's school that would be in Shokokobe, which is about two hours from Accra, the capital. And it lies right off the Volta River, so it's a very ecologically rich area. And because of that, VAM is very interested <coughs> on making ecological stewardship kind of a focal point of VAM Village. So when they approached us about a design, um, they really wanted something that would work with the land as opposed to against it. So the land and the irrigation and um, different ecological factors have really influenced our design a lot. As a transition from last semester to this semester, it's been a, really a shift in our goals. So we started last semester purely in a research phase. Over the past summer, we had gone to Ghana and done preliminary site research, met a lot of individuals that really helped inform our design later through this empathy fieldwork approach. So we started with something called human-centered design. That's something out of systems engineering that was developed by one of our advisors. And she really helped us focus all of the different input that we had into what we want to look at. So the different research that we were approaching from a design perspective, from a systems perspective, from an engineering and sustainability, and also a social perspective. Uh, we had four sub-teams last semester that kind of dissolved into a, more of a collaborative approach this semester. And now we're in that transition phase, and um, we spent the first half or month or so of this semester doing a transition between the research we had done and an actual architectural design. And we did those by starting in these design direct teams. So what these teams were, it was at least one engineer, one architect, and one designer on the teams, as well as the other members of SEG as a whole were split into five separate teams. And we went through a month-long iterative process where every week we had basically a three-hour long review where we would go in and bring different design ideas. People would draw their plans and try to translate the research they had done into tangible designs. And that process was really helpful because it gave us kind of a starting point. It made sure that we didn't forget all the work that we had done last semester, but rather took input from all these different people that were on the team that had worked on all, all different aspects of the project and translated it into different designs. Um, something else that informed our design was the living building project that Anna is going to talk a little bit more about. 
So the living building challenge is something that we started looking at in the fall semester. And just to quickly summarize what it is, it's effectively a certification process that is similar to like the LEED standard. And it uh, gives us guidelines and a framework for SMG for how we might pursue sustainability. So the living building challenge consists of seven different pedals, which you can see on the slide. And really what we wanted to leverage this for was find a way to bring all the holistic thinking of this challenge into our project. And by nature, the standard is verifiable through its assessments and through the actual performance of your structure. Uh, so we know that we can measure the, the success of our design. And from a logistics viewpoint, it's also helpful for pursuing corporate sponsorships and getting fundraising. And within Africa, we might have the potential to also be the first example. So the next thing we had to do was kind of take this abstract uh, standard and find a way to infuse it within our project and make it usable um, on the individual level. So. As I mentioned, the living building challenge consists of pedals, and within those pedals, there are imperatives that uh, provide more detail. So what we did was translate those imperatives into individualized requirements that we could track for our team and link those requirements to an identified owner within the way our design was broken down. So this um, allows the folks that need to focus on specific things that affect their design and help us conduct uh, any feasibility assessment that we, we would need to do on evaluating this, this standard. So the Living Building Challenge comprises of many, many different imperatives. Um, so we wanted to incorporate these all into our design. But rather than taking each specific imperative and creating one small aspect of our design to fulfill that requirement, we wanted to integrate as many as possible into different discrete aspects of our design. So just one example of this is the courtyard concept, which um, you will see much more of later when the actual design is shown. But this is part of the floor plan for our design. And as you can see, this courtyard concept um, kind of comprises of several different components, including obviously the open air courtyard, um, as well as incorporating local greenery and vegetation. Uh, to bring that ecological focus to the classroom right within the courtyard itself. And additionally, as you can see, um, there is a water storage tank which will help with our rainwater collection system. And not only will it be there, um, it will be kind of as a focal point so that the children can learn about how ecologically sustainable their school is rather than just reap the benefits from it. And so this uh, design concept kind of fulfills aspects of different pedals all at once. Um, so the water pedal was really concerned with reducing wastewater and reusing and recycling water and viewing it as a really important resource as much as possible. Um, so clearly our rainwater collection system accomplishes that. Um, there was also a health and happiness pedal um, which kind of focuses on the human experience of the school or of the building. And one of the imperatives within this is called the biophilic environment imperative and its goal is to basically connect the people using this building to nature itself to kind of build upon sustainability um, and create a love for nature that will hopefully go on to do more in the future. And then finally, um, this also fulfills the beauty pedal because um, the Living Building Challenge has this idea that it's all well and good to be very sustainable, but you also want people to be attracted to these designs so that they will continue to pursue them in the future. So this semester was largely allocation in the beginnings of working Living Building Challenge into our design. Starting next semester, we are going to kind of hit the ground running and um, work with Voices of African Mothers to discuss the logistics, as well as reach out directly to the Living Future Institute. Um, we will have to pay a small fee to be registered formally and to begin actively documenting um, our the certification so that as we go the Living Future Institute and um, people involved within and different organizations that have um, pursued Living Building Challenge in the past can assist us with this process. 
Um, and as the design matures, we're going to keep working at the Living Building Challenge so that hopefully in the future we can achieve the certification. So uh, another effort that was going on within the systems team trying to align a lot of the complexity of this project was uh, SysML models or uh, systems modeling language. And all this is is a, a formal language that we utilize to model and communicate the information about a complex system. So building upon the model that we started last semester, and incorporating some of the learnings that we gained through our systems design thinking process, uh, two of the main diagrams that you see on the slide on the left were refreshed and reconstructed um, within our model of SEG. So the first one is the how might we capabilities diagram, which forms the basis for defining our users' needs and originating requirements while the point of view context diagram gives us a general understanding of user to system and user to user interactions. So considering those, this, this gives us the formation of the use case or user behaviors. And in addition to what we were finding through our systems design thinking process and the empathy field work, we were also looking for ways to take our system needs and requirements from the living building challenge, which we just discussed, and then the array of research that we did within the fall semester, um, using those as ways to bring in foundational elements into our model. So looking forward to some of the main activities that we extended upon within um, this spring semester, uh, there was kind of a need to better communicate the relationship that existed between the user behaviors, the systems requirements, the architecture, and the model-based requirements engineering diagram that's on the top of the slide um, was constructed essentially for each use case for our system. Um, and within these diagrams, we included activities that could function as acceptance criteria and give the team guidance for how we would uh, verify and hopefully eventually validate that these elements exist within our design. Uh, to add a layer of detail to the user behavior, uh, we created the emotional activity diagram on the bottom left, and this helps to refine the user behavior, identify system behavior, and derive additional requirements, and uh, hopefully some of the elements of these would uh, give us guidance on future test cases for the system. And, and then finally on the bottom right is an internal block diagram, and this helps us to decompose each subsystem into its components, study how either energy or mass or information is flowing in between these, and what this does is help identify interfaces and how things are interacting. So now we can both structure our team and our design around what different systems are embodied with an SEG. So one of the key goals that we really had for this semester was to take a lot of this abstract information and help the team visualize this and make it more usable. So the, the real benefit here is that we have kind of a continuous flow of information from the functions of our system, the needs of our users, the requirements we're tracking to make sure we accomplish that, and then how we're one day going to verify that through our design process and validate it with assessments uh, such as the Living Building Challenge. So moving forward for the modeling and looking ahead for the rest of the uh, SEG project, uh, really now we have a strong foundation and as we begin to review our design more and seek feedback, we can use the model to provide guidance and help communicate all this information and figure out how we can best evolve the system and bring new content into the model. Um, and then as I said with the acceptance criteria, now we can have a structured process when we go to have a design review and use the model to systematically look at all the different elements and make sure that we're, we're compliant or we're satisfying the needs of our users. So this should be a living, living document, a living process, and hopefully a very useful tool for the team as the design continues to get detailed. Um, so the next phase of our project, after we finish doing a lot of the unpacking and empathetic work and research was prototyping, designing, and testing. Um, so this was much, a much more technical phase. So to start out, 
Um, we created what's called a RACI chart, which is a tool that a lot of people use with project management. And it's essentially a way to allocate tasks. So it stands for Responsible, Accountable, Consult, and Inform. Um, so for every single um, task, and you can see a couple examples here under different categories, we assigned a couple people who would be responsible for working on them. One person who would be accountable for them, which is a, was essentially um, kind of a point person that people could talk to, which helped a lot with the Living Building Challenge certification and other things that we had to get done. And then consult and inform were key stakeholders and other partners that we had to keep involved about what we were doing. So this really helped kind of influence the whole organization of our project moving into the design phase because we had very specific things that we knew that we had to get done and um, a sort of concrete and systematic way of incorporating those um, into the design, into the structural analysis. Um, so we didn't want to just be creating a design on our own research and not understanding fully the users that would be using it. Um, so something that we began last semester um, is our empathy field work, both um, here in Ithaca and in Ghana, to better understand um, different emotions and behaviors that students would have um, by looking at the age group and looking at the culture of um, the So last semester, our empathy field work, uh, we worked with students in Ithaca and Ghana um, by kind of interviewing them, by having them do drawings for us, things like that, and the, some of the largest takeaways that we got from that um, were having like a prominent roof that would give them a more emotional understanding of the holiness of the space. Um, we realized the need for private spaces um, and how important um, community engagement was between the school and the community. So this semester to continue that process we um, moved into testing. Um, so because we actually have a design now we were able to take um, that design, present it to different students here in Ithaca. Um, we went to a couple different elementary schools in the area and were able to interview a lot of students um, and get their feedback. Um, the way we did that, we presented a storybook about a girl um, who goes to school in Ghana at this school that we're building. Um, and we took them through a daily, you know, the daily things that they would do at school, like walking to school or eating lunch, things like that, and kind of got their emotional responses. Um, and their ideas as well. And so through the human-centered design approach and the um, systems engineering, we were able to unpack all that data and come to some big conclusions that we were able to implement into our design. Um, one of them is the hierarchy of spaces, um, being able to understand the difference between um, important spaces, less important spaces, um, being able to accommodate different people, people who have different preferences as far as socialization or needing to be alone. Um, again, with just being able to approach the school um, visually, how does that excite this student? They wanted to see something um, that would really get them in the mindset that they're at school and they're there to learn. Um, and then, of course, interaction with nature outdoors um, with the whole site that we're able to build on, um, being able to engage them in that is something that really came up in the, in the data. Um, so from all the information we gathered, we began to design and create uh, an appropriate design for the school. Um, so drawing on all of the inputs that we got from our client, um, from other members in uh, SG uh, and our research, we, um, we basically categorized all of the information we had into five main design drivers, um, empathy, environment, local, community, and growth. Um, and we basically, when appropriate, used these drivers to inform different decisions we had to make um, when designing certain aspects of our school. So going through the slides, you'll see that we've kind of coded that along the way so you can get an insight into our process and how we used the research uh, continuously as we worked. Um, so just to start with orienting on the site, I think Ariel mentioned this earlier, but we have a site that's about 200 acres from our client, which is enormous, um, located along the Volta River. And so uh, biodiversity is an important aspect of the site. Um, important things for us to consider as we were designing is that the land is nearly level, so there wasn't a huge amount of groundwork that we have to consider. There's no tall growth, but there is a lot of just brush covering um, the site, as you can see. 
Um, there's a little bit of the existing construction, which is an existing 12 classroom building, which we'll talk about more in a second. Um, and because of the condition of the site, we knew that we would also have to construct a new road and decide where that would go. Um, we also wanted to consider the environmental factors, which are that the sun is overhead at all times um, throughout the day in Ghana because it's so close to the equator, and that the wind on this site is coming mostly from the west and south from the south. Um, so zooming in on the existing construction, which, sorry, is that uh, red circle on this slide, um, is the classroom that already exists, and um, kind of our charge from the client was to design a school that had some separation from this building, which is going to serve as a primary school. Um, and so the secondary school that we designed had some separation uh, from it, but also connected into a larger school campus. Um, and so we created a design that would not only uh, facilitate this connection, but would also allow for growth uh, throughout the site in the future should, the, um, should our client decide to build more. So some of the required uh, program on the site, uh, this was a list from our client, were uh, classrooms, the library space, health center, bathrooms, uh, kitchen, dining, and administration. So these were the main uh, drivers for the program of our school. So looking at the general uh, configuration, you begin to see that you first enter through the library, uh, health center, and administration space. This is predominantly to create a, a relationship to the uh, community and the road, the road up here. Uh, so this becomes the first, uh, your first experience within the school. You begin to move then through the uh, circulation to the different uh, classroom modules. Now you're in the internal kind of academic spaces. Um, we'll go into a little bit about, we'll go in more detail about the modules soon. Uh, but basically, it's a two classroom module which share a productive courtyard, which. Uh, as Anna was talking about before, uh, facilitates water collection, uh, vegetative growth, uh, learning garden, etc. Um, and this begins to diagram how water is collected at the various access points throughout the site, um, but then also how the cooling towers begin to connect the different modules. And then finally looking at the event and community space, which begins to uh, create the central uh, community spine, but also mediates the linkage between the existing school and the new school. And then finally, the new public amenities that we're proposing are not just for the new school, but they also uh, can be utilized by uh, the existing students as well. So now looking at the classroom module, um, from here you can begin to see uh, a variety of spaces and different uh, nodes which can which are created within the system. Uh, so you can see, like I mentioned before, they are uh, linked around the perimeter, creating various uh, courtyards within the interior. Uh, looking at more detail, you begin to see uh, this varying, this various uh, levels of porosity within the classroom, which I will explain shortly. Um, and then also how they begin to link with the courtyard condition and the water collection. Um, so looking here, you begin to see how the courtyard and the interior classroom space begin to relate and as well as vertical circulation to kind of an uh, upper story. And here you really begin to see these three distinct zones, the first being circulation, uh, the second being classroom space, and the third being this more private, uh, independent uh, hangout space, which this stems a lot from the empathy field work that uh, we have worked at, not just the field work, but also the testing from the semester where it really found that there was a need for students to have uh, individual as well as collaborative spaces. Um, and then there's also the continuing the idea of hierarchy of spaces, uh, the different layering of the systems, so having different layers. Um, but then lastly, the idea of the roof. We wanted to play with the roof so that it, it didn't necessarily just become this form, but it begins to wrap down, as you can see in the elevation back here. It begins to wrap down over this facade to enclose this internal space up here. And uh, it's a porous fabric, and its fabric is based off the Kente cloth pattern, which is a vernacular design uh, within the region. So we're really kind of pushing the local uh, sustainable uh, building materials. And now looking at kind of the productive section of the classroom, you begin to differentiate, we begin to differentiate these different zones. Uh, first being the uh, evaporative cooling tower, um, and we'll go into the systems a little bit more shortly. 
Um, and then being the classroom zone, then the circulation zone, then the, um, the learning garden, which we based, which had a big emphasis on the living building challenge and this kind of biophilic atmosphere. And then ultimately the water collection site. And the way that the water collection works is the water runs off the roof and then into a channel along the perimeter wall and then gets stored here, uh, creating a kind of focal point and kind of this cultural awareness and bringing attention to um, the kind of sustainable aspects of the school. And now looking at it from the aspect of sense of materiality, um, there is a concrete skeleton for kind of structural protection as well as earthquake resistance. Um, but that is left to a minimum since concrete is an imported material and is uh, not locally sourced. However, the interior walls and uh, different barriers will be formed from uh, earth brick, which can be produced on site. And then that begins to uh, bring us to the, uh, the fabric and the kente cloth, as well as uh, eucalyptus trusses. Uh, the eucalyptus is a species of wood which is invasive in Ghana and it is very uh, sturdy and durable, so it makes a perfect building material. And then ultimately, uh, the tin roof, which would be battened with an acoustic material. Um, but the tin is also a very uh, locally available material. And then looking over here, you can begin to see the three different zones um, of kind of intimacy. So you have the classroom space, which is kind of a very kind of intermediate between public and private space. Um, the circulation, and then ultimately the exterior courtyard out here. Um, and then lastly, the most private space, uh, and kind of the most enjoyable space, seems to be the upper uh, relaxation and hangout space. But what this also shows is a series of porosity that we wanted to explore, and the different thresholds, so from the courtyard being kind of the most open and exposed, and then to the circulation with this uh, fabric screen, and then the, the wood louver doors, and finally the, the rear back wall, which is the most, the most solid. Uh, this is just quickly looking at the passive systems diagramming of how they might work. Um, so the top diagram here is exploring the uh, passive cooling. So essentially the, the air is moving into this evaporative cooling tower where uh, it lowers down into the classrooms, cooling down the space and ultimately exhausting out the high pitch of the roof. But also because the roof is elevated, it still allows um, air to circulate underneath it just kind of to move the air in and out of the space. And then, um, let's say water collection. So the, the water collects on the roof, runs down the channel, and then into this, this gutter that runs along the courtyard wall. Um, and then ultimately, it is collected within the tank. And then lastly, this is, uh, this is looking at the different levels of the different conditions that you can experience with these uh, kind of operable screens. The idea is that the users, the teachers, the students, they can control the amount of light they want in the classroom, the amount of air they want in the classroom, um, and the overall experience they want. So they can have the doors completely open and the screens completely open. Um, however, there are roll down screens that can begin to subdivide different spaces. Um, doors can be open and closed according to the user's needs. But then ultimately, we did face a severe threat of dust storms. And so the idea is that all these screens can be pulled down and all the doors can be shut to kind of really mitigate the amount of dust that enters into the classroom space. All right, so the next important part of our design was this entry sequence, which has the library, administration, and health center. Um, very intentionally, the health center was placed in the front of the complex, um, and the entry faces the main uh, road that we're going to construct. And this is so that um, not only students, but uh, members of the community have access to health education and treatment um, where maybe they didn't otherwise. And uh, this was a charge that came um, directly from our client asking that we pay attention to this especially. Um, another important aspect of this design is, um, you guys can see these like narrow concrete columns uh, along the library. And these are rainwater columns. And what we want to do is take the rainwater collection system that's so such an important part of this school and make it very visible and make it one of the first things you see. So you walk into the school and you know that it's a place that cares about the environment and engages with it. Um, and the way the system works is that basically there's a gutter system um, that the rain collects in and then runs down here, and then another trough system that channels the water into the front of the library, um, which allows gardens to grow along the perimeter. 
So again, it's just one of the first things you encounter and it reiterates that the environment is one of our priorities uh, with this school. Um, so again, walking in, this is the main entrance. On this end, here you see um, the main library space, which is separated on the first floor from the admin. Um, inside here is the termination of that wraparound walkway that Dan had shown earlier. Um, kind of acts as a waiting area for anyone who needs to visit the admin office. Um, and then the health center is on the other side of the main entry, and the, um, main, the main access point for that is again facing towards the road. On the second story of the library, it reads more as uh, a whole volume, and it's a mezzanine level for students to have more of uh, these private spaces that we uncovered are very important from the research. Um, so more casual spaces for either group work um, or just casual reading. Um, so you can see it in the way it's furnished. There's also a mezzanine kind of net hammock that we designed so that students can kind of just grab a magazine or a book and just lie here and read. Um, and then also we incorporated a green courtyard into the first story here to create a separation between the entry reception, the main library space, and uh, the admin again. Um, in section, we can see that in addition to creating this mezzanine level, we also kind of played with the ground level and created a sunken pit here for students, again, to have another type of space to relax and do work uh, as they need to. Um, you can also see from this section that this really, in, on the first floor reads, it's three volumes where you have the entry, reception, where the librarian might sit, um, here where students can work and hang out, and then here is the administration office. Whereas on the second floor, it starts to read more as a continuous volume and is a much more casual space. Um, in this section, we see that if you were to enter through the school this way, um, there's a second story walkway extending through the classroom where you can start to see that this is a very vibrant and active community. Um, you see the health center, again, prominently located for the entrance of the school. Um, and these two buildings kind of flank the main walkway to create an inverted gable. Um, again, coming from the empathy research, which told us that creating feelings of home and comfort uh, through the roof design was very important to the students. Um, finally, the last community space that we worked on in kind of that central spine is this covered pavilion, which during the weekdays during school we envision can be used um, for lunch or school events. And then there's a courtyard here that allows it to transform into a space for community events or markets during the weekends. So again, the school is designed not only for the students and teachers, but also as an amenity um, and an asset for the entire community. Um, so looking at that a little bit, so again, the access point is straight from that main entry. So this whole strip becomes um, a very useful space, not only for the old school, or sorry, for the existing school and the new school, but also for the community at large. Um, here we have two examples showing how this courtyard and pavilion might be used together. So here we kind of see tables set up for lunch uh, for kids from the existing and new school we eat together and have some kind of play space and recess hour in the courtyard. And then on weekends, for example, the space can be changed um, so that local vendors can set up stalls and sell food or goods over here uh, while families sit and eat and relax in the courtyard. And then some of the classrooms can even become transformed to host um, workshops or other activities more for adults and families. Uh, as compared to on the weekdays. So now, moving forward, our next steps for the next semester are primarily going to be working with our local architect and contractor, Ivana, in producing construction drawings. Um, but this also leads into a lot of construction preparation and uh, kind of giving an estimate of materials and what type and quantity of materials will be needed. Uh, we will also need to be working uh, in order to do this very closely with uh, the structures and logistics team. Um, but then also going into architectural fundraising materials. Uh, so this goes uh, more into more, more renderings, more models, more things to engage potential donors. Um, then finally budgeting, which would be uh, worthy, uh, closely worked out with uh, the logistics team for uh, building costs, labor costs, uh, and material costs. So now I will hand it over to Thomas, who's going to talk a little bit more about uh, the energy modeling for the school. Okay, so one of the next steps um, now that we that we can pursue more closely now that we have such a beautiful architectural design is energy modeling. So some of the goals um, of an energy modeling is, of course, to determine the energy demand of the building. So that's something that we can give to um, our renewable energy system so that they can design it. 
also assess the feasibility of the living building challenge. We mentioned that earlier. Um, there are certain numbers that we need to hit in terms of net zero energy um, to get certain pedals for the living building. So this is a way that we can assess whether or not we'll be able to hit those and what we have to do to get that. Also is uh, assessing student faculty comfort. So of course we have to design a building in a region that we're not so sure about. Um, none of us have spent a lot of time there, so this is a way we can measure what the conditions inside the building are. And finally, validating our claim of we are SEG, sustainable education, so we want to be sustainable economically, socially, and of course environmentally. So this is one of the, the best ways we can use to actively assess whether or not we really are sustainable. So one of the ways we do this is we take such a beautiful uh, rhino drawing like that and turn it into a box. <laughs> um, what I've done a lot of this semester is learn ArcSim, which is a plugin for Grasshopper, which is a plugin for Rhino. ArcSim was developed by one of our advisors, Professor uh, Timber Dogan. Um, so I've been working with him to try to set up a model and learn this program. And then once I have, once we had kind of the base set up that turned into collaborating with the architect, so sitting down and talking about the little ins and outs of the design and what the materials are, uh, which draws on research from last semester, such as the weather in Ghana, and of course the little nuances of the materials that we want to use that affect our model. Finally, we can um, take the output from the model and use it to inform the design. So if we have an electricity use number, we can give it to some of the members that are working on um, solar panels and be able to use that to inform design decisions. Uh, we can assess the feasibility of the water, the water collection, the cooling towers. Um, and it, it just spits out a bunch of good results that we can use to form, uh, to tweak the design later. What we see here is a sort of comfort chart. So it's interesting, this is developed for an office where you're wearing a suit and you're working in air conditioned conditions. So the weather in Ghana, which is plotted by the little temperature and humidity points in the white, does not fit in the real, little red box of comfort as it, as it is uh, designated in the US very well. So there's different trade-offs that we have to make to to show we're building a building for the people of Ghana and we want to make it as comfortable as possible and as efficient as possible and we can also use more kind of high-tech models like this to help us out. So next uh, we'll move forward and talk about some of the final material designs and things to move on. <laughs> okay so now that we have our final design we can start looking at uh, the things that we need to do in order to move into the construction phase of this project. Um, and so what that involves is continuing with the energy modeling that Thomas was talking about and various other systems modeling um, to make sure that, you know, by the time we're ready to go build this uh, project, we have all of those things in check. Um, that also involves uh, making final materials decisions with our structures team um, and, doing, uh, and continuing to do um, all the analytics with those uh, new decisions. Um, I'm going to talk more about the communication guide in a minute. Um, and then beyond that, um, we need to continue to make sure that we are meeting all of our stakeholders' needs um, and really uh, designing for all of the uh, specific outcomes that they want from this project. So for instance, um, you see their local computer network. Uh, one of the desired outcomes uh, of this project uh, is to create an, um, an internet network uh, throughout the city of Sobukobe or the village of uh, Sobukobe. Um, so that's going to be something that we're going to continue to look at um, as we move into the final phases of this project. Okay, so um, the logistics team this semester has mostly been working on a communication guide. Um, as we move into the final stages of this project, uh, one of the biggest issues that we're going to have to deal with is funding. Um, and so we are, uh, we've compiled um, this sort of summary that includes information from our design book of last semester as well as all the new research um, from this semester and um, the design itself and turns it into something that we can present to potential uh, corporate sponsors, um, donors, anyone who has um, an interest in this project. Uh, we're going to be uh, presenting it uh, to different companies starting sort of next semester to get into like fourth quarter funding times. Um, since our project was extended this semester, this opens up an opportunity for um, a lot of good contact uh, with different companies. We're also going to be this summer in close contact with uh, Voices of African Mothers. They're having um, some activities happening this summer, so we're hoping that this communication guide can also be used um, to reach out to people who have an interest in their projects generally to sort of expand our audience um, and make sure that we can get um, as many resources as is necessary to uh, complete this project.
So Sarah already talked about, but moving forward into next semester uh, is our final semester of this project. There's a lot of wrap up in terms of the design, making final decisions, and fundraising and promoting because uh, in order to see this building actually built, there are a lot of logistics that have to go into it. Um, so that's just a kind of moving forward outline of what we're working on next semester. Our goal is to build next January, so January of 2017. Um, also including in that time frame is this summer. So a couple of us are on campus this summer as well as a couple of our advisors. So we're working together just to do some of the final logistics stuff. That way we can move into next semester as well as a small team of SEG students that are going out to Ghana this summer like we did last summer to do some more community engagement and outreach now that we have a final design just to get some feedback and, uh, and see how that design is working with the community, how the community has changed over the last year. Uh, the development rate in Ghana is so accelerated because they're developing at such a fast rate, so it's good to see how the community has shifted and how we may need to shift our design to respond to that. Um, so here's just a couple of pictures as a semester overview. Um, you've got a pretty comprehensive vision of what we've done this semester in the final design. Um, but as a thank you, <laughs> there's a laundry list of people that we could thank. Of course, thank you guys for sitting here and looking at our designs. But also thank you, a massive thank you to our four advisors, to Whitney, who's sitting there, Siri, and Tamara, and Ricardo, who couldn't be here. The rest of our team that didn't get to present, um, that made all of this possible, as well as everyone that supported us along the way. Um, there is an endless list of people that this project wouldn't be possible without. So we want to extend a huge thank you to them. Also to our graduating seniors. We have a bunch of systems engineers that are graduating, as well as Andy, who's our one undergraduate senior. And to Dan, who turned 22 yesterday and spent <laughs> the whole day making the renderings that you saw. So um, happy birthday to him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, do you have any yeah, um, and then so also on Dan's birthday, spent creating the drawings, and they're over there if you want to look at them in their full printed out glory. Yeah, so you can kind of look at these. But I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Hey guys, th thanks. I mean, like, you got a really exciting project here in a lot of ways, and I really want it to be uh, successful. I'm going to ask kind of a, a hard question here uh, for you guys. You, you actually have a, a luxury in a lot of ways that you have a little bit of separation between now when you're doing construction diagrams. I'd ask everybody on the team, and you know, system engineers, even if you're graduating, you might want to want to think about about this too. What are some of the aspects of your project that you feel are actually its weakest? I, I, every project has gotten, right? Every project I've ever done, I've, even if I love that project, I always look back to it and saw something that could be improved. And so I really encourage you guys to take that, you know, this opportunity to be reflective with your project and see what are we possibly, you know, missing, screwing up on? You know, where are, is our performance essentially the, the weakest overall for these guys? And are there still some opportunities to, to improve that overall? Because, um, again, uh, you, you've got this little bit of time, take advantage of it. And, and worry about a lot of different kinds of, of those additional things. We tend to focus on the, you know, the overall normal experience for it. Think about all the different ways that things can go wrong in your in your system. So think about worrying about like things like maintenance when you know the every single student is in the hallways at the same exact time. Uh, you know when uh, you know when it's going to flood. Uh, you know going to come through and how how big is that flood? Uh, you know so. All, all those different possible ways that things could go, go wrong, you know, to, to your thing, and, and I think that will really help you guys to, to make you that much stronger as you move in, into this next phase. Thanks, I, I have to, to run to another thing, but I'd love to talk Thank to you guys more. Thanks, guys. Thank you.